just do a brief introduction and then I give the floor to you. Um, just for all the uh, the MBA students, full time MBA. This is the 12 month program that uh, Michelle and Velika are part of, uh, and um, and um, we uh, have uh, these sessions uh, uh, in the parties meet the CEO, but also in uh, in view of innovation and digitalization. And you actually fall in both categories, <laughs> so. Because of course, as digital minister, I mean, what more can we wish? Uh, so you are uh, so welcome. And um, well, especially because you're not only minister, but you also have the experience of the, um, let's say the business side as a consultant of uh, Apple uh, on computational linguistics. You worked uh, for Oxford University Press, where you worked on cloud lexigro uh, lexicography. I mean, what a uh, we well, I can only say um, we are just uh, very eager to uh, to learn about your experience. And of course, COVID-19 gives it an extra dimension. I don't know how it is in your country, but uh, here we have been trying to use uh, digital instruments to uh, track down COVID. So we've been talking about developing apps, but privacy is all the time in the way. So there has been a big discussion in this country on, yeah, if we are going to use these apps, what is the government going to do with the information? And um, in the end, we don't have an app. <laughs> so um, they, I'm sure you have uh, similar challenges. So um, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Minister, for joining us, and uh, uh, and thank you for Michelle and Velika to make this possible for all of us. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Excellent. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, really happy to be here uh, and share with you. Uh, um, this is a Ask Me Anything, uh, and we have two hours. Uh, and so just just feel free to to start thinking of what to ask me. Uh, and we will be using uh, something called uh, Slido. Uh, can you see my screen at the moment? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yes. yes, yes, we can see. Okay. Right. Okay. Yep. Great. Right, so um, using computer, you can go to slido.com slash 605 without a pen sign uh, or with the pen sign actually works both ways. Uh, but if you are using a phone, you can also scan the QR code either way. So either way, we will um, enter this chat room where you can ask uh, pseudonymously, anonymously or with your real name um, any question. And uh, the main uh, reason of using this, the, the chat room is that you can vote each other's questions. So the question with the most number of votes will float to the top, uh, where, while the latest question uh, will appear on the bottom uh, right side. Um, and so uh, if you just start asking questions and upvoting each other's questions, this will be as if I'm having a real time conversation uh, with the entire class. Uh, but of course, also feel free to unmute yourself and speak uh, your questions if you feel that I have not answered uh, something uh, to your uh, satisfaction. So, so this is very dynamic. Please uh, start um, putting whatever on Slido now um, and maybe as simple as saying hi or things like that to just to make sure that the system works um, on both ends. So, um, oh, here you go. You're a very reactive bunch. So uh, uh, anonymous um, person. Uh, would like to say uh, not hi, but rather who, uh, which is great. Um, and uh, I'll just say uh, who not, sorry. <laughs> anyway, so why not? Um, and then uh, so it would go like this, where I highlight one question and go to another and so on. And, and someone says hola, uh, which is great as well. Right, so um, just a, a brief introduction of where I am and salam. That's great. Uh, please keep that going. Um, so um, just a, a brief introduction of uh, where I'm um, at. I'm in the Social Innovation Lab uh, in Taiwan. So and hi, this is in Mandarin characters. Um, and uh, here you can see um, that this is actually a park. So I'm holding this uh, cam and you can look outside of the window and there's just random people. I think they're holding a digital opportunity class uh, outdoors. You can see some Lego blocks showing the global goals. I think that's 11, 3 and 17, if I'm not mistaken. You can judge by its color. Uh, and then um, uh, outdoors, there's a basketball um, 
Also, uh, many people are trying out new uh, extended reality and stuff uh, like Audioscape. So, so the main point is that I am literally working in a park uh, and uh, I walk um, to, to work every day, uh, every morning and walk back uh, and everybody can just drop in and have 40 minutes of my time uh, and just chatting about pretty much anything. The only thing I ask uh, is that everything that um, transpires in this uh, room um, and indeed in all the meetings that I hold is on public record. Uh, and so uh, you can see the public transcripts of everything that I work as a minister. Uh, there's uh, in the past three and a half years, more than 1,000 meetings with more than 5,000 people, over 200,000 speeches, including internal meetings. And this is called radical transparency. Uh, and uh, it makes sure that when lobbyists come to me, uh, they argue only on public benefits for example, David Kluf uh, visited me uh, early on and argued uh, for Uber um, to get uh, introduced in Taiwan. Uh, and the very first thing, um, you know, is doorbell because this thing is not only on textual record; it is actually on 360 video record. You can put on a VR glass and relive the conversation. Uh, and then um, at the end of it, uh, David said, "I do think there are some details that we can work out." I said, uh, "Ask the local team to send you stuff." I'm like, uh, "Just know everything you send my way will be made public." Um, and so this is very interesting because then um, all his arguments is based on uh, you know reducing traffic jam, uh, reducing pollution, mitigating climate change, uh, and things like that. Better utilization of public uh, transportation, uh, public roads, open data, data collaboratives, and so on. Because in this setting, there's literally Literally no way to uh, to lobby in a way that only benefits your company at the expense of other companies. That's how radical transparency works. And so, um, in the digital um, social innovation, we use the same principle to counter uh, the coronavirus. And this is not the wrong slide. This is actually the right slide um, with cute dogs, and uh, uh, that explains um, physical distancing. Um, uh, cover your mouth and nose when sneezing. Uh, don't put the head to your mouth. Uh, remembering to pre-order your medical mask. Um, and all of these are um, just creative people uh, making their variations on the same, using Creative Commons materials, including my picture and the dog's picture. Uh, the dog uh, is not Shutterstock, uh, literally um, is a companion animal of the participation office of our health and uh, welfare ministry. So in each ministry, uh, we have an extended team of uh, people who are in charge of public engagement and the uh, uh, health and welfare one lives with this dog. So when we have a daily press conference and introduce a new measures to counter coronavirus, they just translate it into an internet meme uh, with the dog where people can very freely translate and remix. And so that's another part of it. In addition to uh, radical transparency, this also produced tons of Creative Commons materials that people can freely remix and increase the R0 value, the basic transmission rate of good ideas. They, they are ideas worth spreading. Uh, and that is the, our basic counter disinformation strategy, which is called humor over rumor. Um, and so the main idea of humor over rumor then uh, is to make sure that uh, we uh, proactively share scientific knowledge. You uh, are already saw my meeting transcripts and uh, scientific uh, physical distancing stuff. And we also react uh, within a couple hours whenever there's any trending rumor with a higher basic transmission rate than one. For example, uh, back in um, uh, a couple months ago in April, uh, there was a conspiracy theory. Uh, there's an internet rumor that says uh, because Taiwan is ramping up medical mask production from 2 million masks a day to 20 million a day, we're going to soon run out of tissue papers because it's the same material. Of course, it's not, but the rumor says it is. So it provokes outrage and have a higher basic transmission rate than one. Uh, so within a couple of hours, our premier, our prime minister, uh, who looks like this, that's our prime minister, Su Jinchang, uh, posted this on the social media, which is the backside of our premier. Uh, and he's showing his bot buttons, uh, wiggling it a little bit. Uh, and then um, with a huge caption that says, uh, uh, each of us only have one pair of buttons, uh, which means that it doesn't make sense to uh, stock a uh, pile of tissue papers. Uh, and so this is hilarious. I mean, this, this whole picture is packaged like a tissue paper box. Uh, and so it went viral. And um, people saw uh, this table, this important table that says the tissue paper are made out of South American materials, while medical masks are made of domestic materials. So that's the pay payload of this meme. But people who saw this and laughed about it gets vaccinated. It's literally impossible uh, for joy and anger to coexist 
uh, in the kind of control panel of the mind if you have watched the film Inside Out. And so when uh, this colored tissue paper, yellow, means that people associate with humor and joyful um, uh, mood, uh, the conspiracy theory uh, stops being viral. Uh, it reduces the R0 value of that conspiracy theory. And indeed, we can see through social media that it decreases and the conspiracy theory dies down within a couple of days, just as with the pandemic. Um, and so we countered the infodemic by making sure that our humor versus rumor have a higher transmission rate and that people who contacted this meme um, you know, gets vaccinated, inoculated against uh, this information. So we don't have to resort to takedowns or lockdowns um, to counter the infodemic. So that's the humor over rumor part. That is also a lot of uh, engagement strategy broadly based on this. So I, I'm just beginning with this kind of random five minute talk so that you have time to en enter your questions. Uh, so it, like by now, is there anything anybody who want to talk about? You can also, instead of using Slido, just start uh, speaking. Well, I would have a question, but I wanted to give the, the students uh, first. Please. But uh, could I ask it uh, um, now? Yes. Yeah? yes. So, so um, how do you cope? Since I'm, I'm looking at the Netherlands, and we have, um, I think, using digital tools um, is really difficult at this uh, time of COVID, where we see clear uh, advantages, just like with the electronic uh, patient uh, file, we see clear advantages, but time over time, we fail to implement them in the Netherlands in a um, yeah in a smooth way, uh, because all the time privacy is in the way. And then even though people see the advantages and they share probably more with uh, uh, you know on Facebook uh, and, uh, and 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 in all kind of other uh, social outlets, social media outlets, but. If it comes to uh, doing something as uh, the government, uh, it's always opposed. How do you deal with that? How can you actually implement as a digital minister? I'm sure you uh, you have this on a daily basis. How do you do that? Well, by making sure that it is the people who develop this technology and people who control those technologies. Uh, we are in not in the business of state surveillance. We are in the business of making the state transparent to the people, not the people transparent to the state. Uh, and because we're a liberal democracy. Uh, and so um, if you look at the uh, COHAC, which is the counter coronavirus collaboration hackathon, uh, COHAC, um, you can see easily that all the top winning teams um, from seven countries are privacy enhancing technologies. Uh, for example, let's just look at Lockboard. Uh, Lockboard is a system that uh, records the health information of individuals before they arrive at hospitals. So uh, they focus on uh, building uh, your kind of um, self-reported symptoms, temperatures, whereabouts or whatever, but it works in airplane mode. It, it never transmits anything to anyone, not even Bluetooth or anything. So it's purely your kind of electronic diary. Uh, however, if the contact uh, tracing uh, medical officer come and visit you and ask, uh, where have you been? Uh, in the past 14 days, then this generates a one-time link. Uh, and, and this is exactly with only the precise information that is needed by contact tracing and none of the privacy information of the other people that you have met or anything like that. And so basically this proactively protects privacy by acting in the citizen's best interest, because as opposed to uh, traditional interviews where you can divulge more private details of all your friends and families uh, than this kind of tools, this actually helps you safeguarding uh, your friends and family's privacy while still getting the kind of absolute minimal information that the contact tracers need. Uh, and so this serves at the best interest of the person and it's open source. Everybody can uh, take a look at it. Uh, and uh, there's an international uh, organization called My Data, and this is the Taiwan chapter of it. And Autonomy uses this trip of ledger to do this on a neighborhood scale uh, where people who care a lot about each other's health can share data between them, but it never goes to a cloud. Uh, that is to say, it never goes to a centralized uh, database. And Gemini uh, makes a visual storytelling of the trends and visualization so that people can get themselves informed again without involving a centralized state or um, capitalist multinational. And, and so there, there's a, um, a kind of theme to the Taiwanese model of uh, 
social innovation is uh, what I call data collaborative. It's variously called uh, data trust, uh, data collision, data co-op, uh, there's a lot of words for that. But the main idea um, is very simple, is that the social sector <coughs> um, keeps every stakeholder accountable. Uh, and so this is one such example, the real-time medical uh, mask, mask map, right? Anywhere in Taiwan, you can see your nearby pharmacy, how many adult uh, masks are in stock and how many children's. And you can use your national health insurance card to go there and swipe it and collect nine if you're an adult and 10 if you're a child every two weeks. Um, but this, instead of being published every day or every week, is published every 30 seconds. So this is precisely like a distributed ledger because yeah. uh, everybody can go to a pharmacy, collect those nine masks, wait a couple of minutes, refresh the map or 100 tools like chatbots, voice assistance, and actually see the number decrease by nine or 10. And so if it rather increases, you will call yeah. uh, 1922, right? You will call to right. see, see something wrong is going on. And, and so, is there something yeah. written on the Taiwanese uh, model, so to speak? Is there something that we can read about it? Because yes, I would love definitely. to send this to our government. Definitely. Uh, there's a website called Taiwan Can Help That Us. Uh, I pronounce Taiwan Can Help Us. Uh, and, and the main picture is who can help Taiwan. Um, and, and this is even more interesting because this is not a government website. This is just uh, oh. going through a, a lot of uh, iterations by crowdfunded uh, YouTubers and uh, crowdsourced uh, content. So if you do go to Taiwan Can Help That Us, you can see that this is entirely uh, in, this, in the social sector. And, and this, is, uh, this shows all the people who crowdfunded to make it a reality, a cute animation that asks who can help, Taiwan can help, in a time of isolation, which is solidarity, a timeline of the pandemic, and a crash course. And this crash course uh, is voiced by a famous YouTuber, uh, Dr. Chen Jianren, uh, the top epidemiologist, uh, the academician that literally wrote an epidemiology textbook, and also our vice president. Uh, so, wow. uh, this is, um, uh, if you uh, know the idea of unfair advantage, this is yeah. unfair advantage. In that literally, the person who knows the most about epidemiology was the vice president <laughs> when the coronavirus uh, break. <laughs> outbreak happens. So, so um, the top epidemiologist is just doesn't need to convince the vice president because he is the he vice is. president. Yeah, no, that, that's a uh, uh, course in multiple languages to yeah. share with people. And then um, the people uh, with the rationed mask, they can also dedicate their uncollected quota. Maybe they have some to spare to international audience. So we gave out like 5 million masks in the name of more than 600,000 citizens. Uh, half of them chose to be uh, Anonymous, half of them chose to review their name. So you can see exactly who dedicated how many masks uh, yeah. so far for international humanitarian assistance. So I, I oh, have a question okay. from uh, Alok. Uh, yes. Alok, can you please uh, unmute and ask your question? Hi, Audrey. Good morning. Uh, sorry, I don't know what time it is in Taiwan. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, good morning. Uh, interestingly, Slido doesn't allow big questions, so <laughs> so I have to switch on my mic. Uh, uh, it's very uh, interesting to see uh, rumor, uh, oh sorry, humor over rumor. I think it's very creative. Uh, it looks pretty good. Uh, I have a question uh, when you were talking about how to discourage lobbying uh, in the country and made it, making it public. My question is that how far do you go to make it public? Uh, I'm sure there are deals involved, there are pricing structure, and there are some confidentiality clause, confidentiality clause and there is a fair practice clause also involved. How far do you go in the public? And uh, and how far you do that to win the trust of the people? Because at some point of the time, I think people get engaged, hooked onto it, and when they don't see uh, those data points, because that's the expectation builder, uh, you're building also expectation for people, right, in the public. So that's my question, how far you go there? Yeah, so it's a great question. So if you go to visit.pdis.tw, visit.pdis.tw, uh, you will see exactly how we do it. It's a protocol of handling official visits to Maine. And it says that uh, there's only a few exemption, uh, exemptions like um, elected public officials uh, and foreign nationals that are professional diplomats. Other than that, um, everything should be made public. And if verbatim transcript is to be published, it allows 10 days of co-editing. And that's when, if you bring up an anecdote about your acquaintance who have not cleared that for public uh, con con uh, you know, reading, then you can redact that. 
but everybody can only edit their own part of the speech. So on the most extreme case, you will see me talking to myself because the other party have removed every single thing uh, from the transcript. And, and that is allowed. I will essentially rephrase their question uh, to me. And so um, you will see then, for example, recently there's such a visit um, and uh, you can see um, there's this um, person uh, with the name question and where I essentially just repeat their question. Uh, and then, but in a way that doesn't compromise their uh, details because there may be some whistleblowing involved. There may be some uh, power imbalances involved. And so this is a very considerate um, um, protocol, but I always uh, publish everything that I said uh, within the context. So, so I think that is uh, the protocol. Feel free to uh, consult the protocol. We, we put a lot of care in designing that. Um, do well, I go to- yeah. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I think it answers my question, but there are a few questions, I'll go, but I'll park it for later. Later, like later part of the session. Okay. Yes. So maybe yeah. I'll go yeah. to the slider questions. Yes. Yeah. Are okay with that? I mean, there are three votes. So, okay. So um, the question trending now uh, is, quote, when you make decisions to tackle a particular situation, let's say the rumors about the tissues, are you faced with any internal oppositions and how do you tackle it, unquote? No, there's no internal opposition. Uh, back when we complained that pe the government doesn't respond quick enough to people's uh, questions and trending uh, issues, we occupied the parliament back in the 2014 to demand transparency. Uh, that's called the Sunflower Movement. Um, and so because of that, uh, the, at that time, Taiwan was deliberating a trade deal, the Cross-Strait Service and Trade Agreement with Beijing. Uh, and uh, more than 20 NGOs mobilized this uh, Occupy, which is completely peaceful, over three weeks half a million people on the street, many more online, and every day we inches toward the rough consensus using deliberative technologies, including digital and analog. And so uh, after the Occupy, everybody who is for this kind of uh, real-time conversation uh, gets elected as mayors, sometimes to their surprise. Uh, and uh, people who oppose this kind of, um, you know, uh, humor over rumor or open government or whatever, they lost their election. Uh, and so that uh, marks a shift in the political norm. Uh, basically, everybody is for it. This is uh, open government. It's one of the very rare thing uh, that our parliament, all the four parties, agrees on that. Of course, I'm nonpartisan. Uh, I, of course, agree on that. But I'm very happy to see that is uh, one of the least divisive issue in Taiwanese politics, in that the government should respond in the here and now to the people through radical transparency and participation. Um, any follow-up questions, or I'll just go to Clement's question. Um, um, I, 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 I think first those questions, uh, perhaps uh, the next question on that, yeah. That you have, um, I think, Sabri, as of oh, Clement, Clement, yeah. Clement, yes. Clement said, do you find radical transparency that can push some people or organization off from discussing with me, or does it generally always push them to be open? Um, certainly. Uh, there are people who just refrained uh, from discussing um, these issues because the things they work on is essentially uh, to their own profit, but to the detriment of other people. Uh, and these people do not come to my office out for obvious reasons. Uh, it's just like my office. Uh, half of my office are um, delegates uh, from each ministry uh, who are secondments in, in essence uh, to my office. So uh, from each and every um, Ministry, there can be one delegate, uh, and so well, they are a very cheerful bunch. Uh, but in any case, so well, what I'm trying to get at is that um, so this is actually a a police from the Ministry of Interior uh, and from the National Development Council uh, and uh, from the Ministry of Culture, um, National Communication Commission, Ministry of Education, of, of Law, of uh, Foreign Affairs. Basically, all the pretty much all the people facing uh, ministries have uh, in, um, dispatched uh, one second bench because we don't allow for more than one uh, in a team. And so this is a entirely cross-functional team, and they still report to their ministers. Uh, I'm not their kind of new boss. Rather, I ask them only to work out loud. That is to say, to share their innovation with the public, the civil society. And so even internally, this way of radical transparency uh, breaks silos because then they can share their best practices uh, and they can find that their values do align actually on sustainability and many other things with other ministries. They don't have to invent everything alone within their ministry. And so that changes the culture. So that when I tour around Taiwan, in addition to my um, 
you know, uh, weekly uh, Wednesday office hour, I tour around Taiwan uh, every other Tuesday or so, and sometimes also weekends, and go to the most remote places, the indigenous nations, uh, the remote islands, the places that are far off from Taipei. And I just live with the people there, maybe for a, a night or two, uh, doing a ethnographic um, hanging out uh, with people. Uh, and then people would just uh, learn to trust me a little bit and then start speaking their hopes and fears and worries. And when we do that, it's entirely local. It's just me who travels. But everybody in the Social Innovation Lab, all the 12 ministries I just mentioned, their section chiefs and above, are in Taipei or other municipality joining through extended reality, this virtual meeting room. So that there's a town hall for the local people, they just show up to the town hall, but the central uh, government respond to them in the here and now. And that also cuts through a lot of bureaucracy because then people can just innovate and see their innovation getting amplified through this uh, continuous integration of social ideas. And we attract everything at socialinnovation.taiwan.gov.tw. And the best ideas, if they're uh, against the rules, uh, then it, actually they get um, a year or half a year, usually a year, to try out that their version of the rules is better than our version of the rules. That's called a regulatory sandbox. Uh, it could be around self-driving vehicles, fintech, um, platform economy, 5G, you name it. Um, other than, I think, money laundering and funding terrorism, because we know how that would turn out, um, everything else is fair game. And you can challenge any part of the rule making. So this is open innovation, right? If it, uh, the new rule, uh, around e-scooters, for example, uh, or whatever, um, fails. Then uh, we thank the investors. They paid a lot. Everybody learned a little bit. It's like a reverse lottery. Uh, but if it wins, um, then they have the first mover advantage. And so it's a very flexible way of regulatory co-creation with the innovators while ensuring also, um, this is the front door of the, my office, Social Innovation Lab, uh, while also ensures that when people bring in like self-driving tricycles, uh, they can work with the nearby market, literally anyone who walks into the park to co-create the norms around self-driving vehicles. For example, people said that um, because there's a flower market nearby, they have a lot of heavy flower pots. They want to use it as shopping carts, as essentially things that follow them around rather than that they sit on it so they can do hand-free shopping. And if they get, get full, uh, then the platooning kicks in and then this uh, steps back a little bit, summon another one. So you have a fleet of self-driving shopping carts uh, that can help you navigating the flower market. And so this norm, first approach interacts with the market, sets the perimeter for code, and then for regulatory co-creation, uh, making sure that people can modify it however they want. Like in the flower market, you will want this to have two eyes, not to see. It use LIDAR, it doesn't really need those eyes. However, it shows who they're following and things like that. There's social co-domestication of emerging technologies. So to answer your question, anyone who want to break the law can go to meet me, but only if they're breaking the law to create a better new law. Uh, if they're breaking the law just for black hat purposes, that is to say to their benefit and other people's detriment, then of course they do not need a sandbox application, just like you know, if they're funding terrorists or doing money laundering, they don't come to see me. I have a question because you're also a filmmaker. How, as a minister, do you still have time to to and do you and, and if you if not, do you miss it? Because I these are two different worlds, and I can imagine that uh, they can inspire you at the same time. But uh, do you miss it, or do you still have time? I have time to to make films. I have time to code. Uh, I have time to to make creative work and also even translate some poetry uh, because I'm a, a politician. I'm not a politician. So uh, as a politician, my, my main work. <laughs> that. That's a new word. <laughs> as a politician, my main work is is poetry. Uh, and so a film, whatever, is just extension of that poetry. So I often say that I'm a lowercase minister. It means that I advocate and preach about sustainability and digital innovation, but I'm not an uppercase minister where I order you around. And this is important because I believe the power of art uh, really moves the social innovations around. That cute dog picture and many cute uh, dog picture films uh, is the key to get people into the very good hand sanitation habits. The short films that prompts people to wear medical mask as a social signal to say, I'm washing my hands, I'm not touching my face. That is even more effective than, say, you know, wearing a mask 
uh, respects other people or some other altruistic incentive. So if you do your incentive design right in a very short film, like 15 seconds or a minute, you can get the idea that's worth spreading, spread. And that is how we fight the pandemic together by getting everybody to say, oh, we can improve on it. That's remixing. That's also part of the contemporary culture about video making. Sure. And what is your latest work? I mean, I'm sure a lot, but <laughs> what is the last yeah. thing you did? Yeah, the, the, the last thing is, is um, literally me uh, speaking to the camera in a very short uh, five and a half, uh, well, almost six minute video about the uh, uh, fast, fair and fun. And we played that video uh, in the mini lateral meeting of 14 countries, uh, I think three days before the World Health Assembly. Uh, and so we have Taiwan Health its own mini lateral uh, of top health officials uh, where we share the fast, fair and fun principles. And that was the film. You can find it on um, actually the homepage of PEDIS, Public Digital Innovation Space. If you go to pedis.tw, as I just did, uh, this is actually uh, the, the latest film where you can see me talking about uh, digital social innovation. It's also properly captioned and stuff. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. We'll have a look at it. Yeah. So I guess uh, there are some questions uh, from, uh, let me see, I see it on your screen, or is that not a question? Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, it's a, it's a question, it is a question, it just lacks the question mark, it's a unmarked question. So <laughs> um, the, the question is around uh, digital identity and uh, DIDs in particular, distributed uh, self-sovereign uh, digital identities. So uh, do you think it will be solved by governments, a existing tech giants or a tech startups, all of the above? The, the great thing about the DID is that everybody can be part of the ecosystem. Uh, and it's just like the, the open web or the internet, that's the inter in the internet. Whereas each network operator is free to operate their own local network, they have to agree on basic uh, like the um, border gateway protocols, the internet exchange protocols, of course the internet protocol itself, uh, whether the fourth or the sixth version, uh, to participate in the inter part of the internet. And because the internet engineering task force, um, where I also contributed, um, has no army or navy, we, we really cannot force any telecom operator to use our solutions. So we need to do what I just shared with you, which is through uh, radical transparency, radical participation to show that there is some shared value among all the different positions uh, among stakeholders. So actually my work in the Taiwan uh, digital uh, public innovation space is to take internet governance and just project it also on the uh, you know, good old bureaucracy, uh, and it seems to be working. Uh, and so uh, distributed identities is one such issue that internet uh, lacks that layer at the very beginning, because it used to be a very small network. Uh, and now we're kind of building that part in uh, using the uh, latest W3C and ITF um, um, specs. And the great thing about those specs is that it's a multi-stakeholder approach where you can see the editor be a tech giant. Uh, actually, the main work may be done by a tech startup or vice versa. And the great thing about permissionless innovation and end-to-day in innovation is that uh, any spec doesn't preclude a better spec from happening. Bitcoin did not stop Ethereum from happening. And so I think that will continue to evolve. And I think the main thing that uh, we, uh, the policymakers, need to do uh, is to follow closely so that the algorithms, uh, they may lead uh, the society a little bit, but ultimately it is the social norms that lead the technologists so that, uh, for example, AI become assistive rather than artificial intelligence. So that's my main reading. It's a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, time management. So um, two people, three now. So um, I, I used the good old uh, Pomodoro method uh, where I work, you know, 25 minutes at a time and I internalize that. So I have a kind of gut feeling that I'm inching to it uh, the 25 minutes past uh, the clock or 55 minutes past the clock. Then I take five minutes off and do some social media stuff. Uh, and so my point here is that the Pomodoro method is less about this um, 30 minute chunks, although they, they help, but rather this is about um, getting up in the morning uh, and setting your priorities straight for the day. 
Uh, and if you continue to do that, uh, then you can uh, make sure that you delegate everything, uh, including the active delegation to other people. And then you can focus on the creative work that you enjoy. That's how I remain a politician, uh, even becoming a digital minister. Uh, and so in a sense, we're making a film together because it's a recorded session. But the point here is that uh, if you do not feel like you are the best person to do something, you can take 25 minutes to delegate that away. And that applies even to uh, the act of find, finding out who is the best person to delegate. I think that is uh, management. So um, then what is best exercise? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I walk um, sometimes quickly uh, to the social innovation lab and back. That's pretty much the only exercise, uh, but I regularly do that. And the trick of getting up early in the morning, even though it's raining, uh, and do that walk is because I put all my devices in my office. Uh, in my home, there is no um, uh, touch screens. Um, the only phone that I keep is a landline and a Nokia 8110, uh, <laughs> where there's no touch screen. That's the phone that uh, Neo uses in the Matrix movie. Uh, so anyway, so the point here is that by depriving myself of touch screens and uh, broadband connectivity and in my home, I get up and I get, need to get some work done, so I better start walking quickly uh, to the office. So that's how I motivate my daily exercise routine. It may or may not apply to you. So uh, Sabri has a compliment, uh, and thank you for the compliment. Um, do we move on, or are there follow-up questions? Um, I think uh, the, the question, what is your um, ambition for Taiwan, I see. I find an interesting one. Uh, um, mm -hmm. what, uh, what is it uh, that you are going to, what is your vision for the next uh, year, or the next few months? Next year. So. Um, I predict, and with some accuracy, uh, I'm, I'm firmly, uh, it's my conviction, uh, that a year from now, uh, the peak of Taiwan, the Savia, the Jade Mountain, will raise by three to five centimeters. Um, that's a geological fact. Taiwan is rising uh, toward the sky. Uh, and, and this is because uh, we're caught between uh, the uh, tectonic plates of the Eurasian plate on one side and the Philippine Sea plate on the other. And they bump into each other all the time. So we have earthquake all the time. Uh, but because we're very resilient, we build our structures in a way that it survives earthquakes, both physical ones and ideological ones. Uh, and so that uh, after each earthquake, Taiwan rises a little bit more uh, toward the sky. And that's my idea around transculturalism. Taiwan has more than 20 national languages, each representing indigenous, Austronesian, uh, new immigrants, all sorts of different cultures, including multi-stakeholder internet culture, uh, hacker culture. And so all these cultures uh, just bump into one another because we're a place with absolute freedom of speech. According to Civicus Mondi, they're the only country in Asia with absolute uh, freedom of speech. Sometimes they create innovations uh, that no other cultures can see. For example, when we legalized um, marriage equality a year uh, ago, um, we, we legalized uh, all the bylaws, uh, that is to say the rights and duties of marriage, but none of the in-laws, that is to say the family relationships. And that's the Taiwanese innovation that take care of the uh, cultures of the more um, old people, of people of which uh, to them, the East Asian marriage is r r rather a marriage between two families like Romeo and Juliet um, era stuff. Uh, and for the younger people, it's mostly about uh, two individuals. So we create a hyperlink act and hyperlinked the same sex marriage only to the bylaws and not the in-laws. And that's uh, after two referenda and one constitutional court ruling pleased everybody the vast majority of people are now happy in Taiwan about marriage equality, unlike many other jurisdictions. So that's a real example of how this ideological earthquake ends up uh, letting us rise toward the sky and on a higher shared value uh, vantage point. So I see Taiwan continue doing that uh, among all the different global goals. Is there, I th uh, you want mm -hmm. to answer one of the uh, questions there? Uh, I hesitate because uh, most of the question now only have one vote. I don't know whether it's uh, ah. of interest to other people. Maybe you want to vote on the questions a little bit. Anyway, so the next question says, from the government perspective, how does the government gain trust from citizens when using digital tools and how it to be developed in the future uh, after the crisis? Um, so we gain the trust from the citizens by trusting the citizens. 
uh, to give no trust is to get no trust. And by trusting the citizens, we mean not only radical transparency that makes sure that people understand the why of policy making, not just the what of the policy. We'd also make sure that anyone who want to improve it can do so because it's open API and or open source. Uh, that is to say, when people want to tweak those ideas, they do not have to ask for a patent or a license or anything. They can just work on the data collaborative. So I'll use one uh, example to illustrate the point. Um, this is called uh, Airbox. So this is uh, what you're seeing is the PM 2.5 level, I think, uh, of uh, Taiwan and each dot is a measurement station uh, of microsensor uh, from a person's um, home balcony or uh, more likely than a primary school uh, because they use it to teach uh, data stewardship. Uh, and so um, I think this picture is quite old, actually three years old now. Uh, at this point, there's close to 10,000 uh, measurement stations like this. So covering pretty much uh, all parts of Taiwan uh, that has um, people. Uh, and so people can very easily see uh, what is the temperature or pollution or whatever like in the civil IoT system, which is entirely led by the social sector. And when they built this, the environment minister only have less than 100 measurement points, even though very precise, they're very far away from people. So if you have two numbers, one from very far away and run by the government, and one run out by your primary school teacher uh, in your nearby primary school, you're probably going to trust the school teacher's numbers. Uh, and so there's strength in numbers. And because they publish every real-time measurement to a distributed ledger, um, so it keeps people honest, right? You cannot go back in time and modify the time, uh, the measurement uh, numbers. And so they gain legitimacy. And in Taiwan, uh, we always say we can't be the social sector, we must join the social se sector. So we sat down and found out what they need. And turns out uh, they allow the government, the environment minister to calibrate their uh, census uh, to produce it in a more cheap um, uh, pr production facility while remaining um, uh, stable uh, in all humidity levels. But in exchange of the government using their numbers, they ask us to complete the puzzle to put measurement stations on some noticeable gaps. And those gaps are in industrial parks. These are private properties. Uh, and so they cannot just break and enter and install uh, those um, measurement stations. And so it turns out that we own the lab, the municipal and central government own the lab in the industrial parks. So we made an agreement, made a deal so that we make um, government data using also microsensors. And we share that in a, uh, I think, top 20 supercomputer in the world, uh, the National High Speed Computing Center, so that people working on analytics models and algorithms can do in-place computation to uh, predict the weather and the pollution level. And that has been extended to water box and so on. So the main point about data collaboratives here is that when the social sector knows exactly how it works, it controls the data or at least is part of the distributed ledger, then of course they trust each other more and they can choose to trust the government or not. But the government gets legitimacy by saying we're joining, not replacing the social sector work. And that is the, the trick of um, gaining the trust from the citizens by making sure that we maximally trust the citizens. So after the pandemic, uh, because we never closed the, any schools. Uh, there's been zero lockdowns uh, in Taiwan, and it's been like 30 days or so uh, with no local uh, confirmed cases. But we're now moved uh, firmly in the post pandemic. Uh, the CECC is now touring around Taiwan, just as I do, um, and uh, enjoying the local food and live streaming, all of it. Uh, and so we're, we're firmly moving in the direction uh, where we are even giving out the stimulus coupons. So the same uh, like uh, mask map and uh, uh, civil society made um, mask distribution visualization is now being repurposed for our stimulus package, uh, which is also a very interesting mechanism design. Um, you can just uh, uh, spend, I think, 3000 Taiwan dollars, uh, which is around, I don't know, 100 euros, um, 90 euros. Uh, and if you spend 90 euros, uh, and the government understand you have spent it not on e-commerce, but on uh, like real face-to-face um, -face, uh, consumption, then you can go to a nearby uh, telemachine, a nearby ATM, and then uh, out of those 90 euros, you get 60 euros back as cash, like a cashback. 
program. It will probably also spend that cash. And so that's the stimulus package because we over rely on the e-commerce and uh, delivery and contactless delivery and so on during the pandemic. We're now resuming face-to-face -face, um, commerce and the stimulus package is um, basically participatory where people just engage in um, working with each other to uh, choose the kind of values that they do. Uh, for example, I'm going to focus on the uh, social enterprises that can maximize um, transparency, like um, the Human Rights Watch uh, or whatever. And if they have services or products, I'm going to spend my stimulus uh, 90 euros there and maybe actually adding a lot more to it. And I'll get the cash back and, and use that as a social signal to say, oh, I'm then spending this to another uh, pro-social so, uh, enterprise. And so this uh, offers plenty of chance for people to brag in social media uh, how much public benefit they have caused by their stimulus uh, consumption. And again, this is the all of society mobilization process. So that's where we're going and after the pandemic. It's not like all, all over, but uh, it's been very health, um, healthy and safe in Taiwan now. Um, ah, there's more votes. I'm happy to see more votes. Eight people <laughs> would like to know, can you throw some light on the strain relationship with the PRC, with China? Um, I understand recently China blocked Taiwan's seat to the WHA for the COVID discussion. Well, as I said, we held our own unilateral um, and hosting the uh, virtual meeting from the um, Ministry of Health and Welfare. And I would say with a much higher uh, broadband video quality than the actual WHA. Um, but in any case, um, we, what, what we found is that the international community really likes the Taiwan model because we strengthen democracy, strengthen liberal democracy while countering the pandemic, whereas many jurisdictions is being faced with this uh, false um, dilemma between, say, you know, human rights on one side and public health on the other. And so any part of the Taiwan model um, is kind of automatically applicable to a liberal democracy, ranging from the daily press conference to the medical mask, uh, to the Doge CEO humor versus rumor and so on. And so it's a epicenter to epicenter collaboration. And it doesn't matter whether we're a member observer or whatever, because the seat order, you can't really see them when you're in a teleconference. Uh, actually, you can rearrange the window however you want. So <laughs> the, the diplomatic protocols uh, are being reshaped and the top medical officers previously very difficult to invite to online conferences are now, you know, trapped in their home anyway. Uh, and so we can very easily uh, invite them to join our, our online conferences. But actually, I've been doing this uh, very regularly now. So in IGF, um, the Internet Governance Forum, which is part of the um, um, UN, uh, we gave a talk in UN Geneva uh, in the IGF, uh, but entirely through telerobotics. So uh, the, the digital double of me basically um, spoke uh, in the UN um, in Geneva. Uh, however, because they checked the passports, um, they cannot allow uh, people with Taiwanese passport in. But I went in anyway uh, as a robot, as you can see here. Uh, that's me here. Yeah. So and then and then uh, the robot can turn, it can walk around, it can talk to people uh, and can share uh, our ideas around digital opportunity and so on. Uh, and so it, it, it's a new diplomatic norm. Uh, and while the people from the PRC uh, on their did protest, um, it, at the end, it's just playing a movie, um, even though the movie was recorded two seconds ago. Uh, but it's still just playing a movie. And my words are on the record. And the PRC ambassador did not leave the room, meaning that um, they think it's OK with a certain UN resolution. So I've been doing this pretty regularly uh, since then to now. I'm just very happy that the top medical of officers and many other officers are now embracing the same uh, technology as I did in 2017. But uh, I chose that back at the time, not only to challenge the diplomatic norm, but also because I uh, adjust my jet lag very slowly. I generally don't like uh, long distance travel. And also, I want to reduce the carbon footprint uh, by air travel. So we'll continue doing mini laterals over uh, internet and our multi-stakeholder forums. So seven people would like to know, which advice would you give future leaders of bureaucratic organizations, either private or public or social, uh, or to initiate a culture change toward co-creation and agility? Um, so um, I'll share my uh, HR policy uh, first. So as I said, every ministry 
that's facing the society now probably want to send dispatches and segments to my office. And when I uh, do my HR evaluation, there's only two things that I look at. First, this person need to bring a fresh perspective, uh, need to complement the existing team members uh, on a new way of looking at things, which means they probably have a different background, different training, uh, different um, you know, intersectionality, uh, uh, neurodiversity, uh, and things like that. Uh, so if they are too much like one another, then th that, that doesn't work. So that's a, th a fresh perspective. And the second thing is that uh, they need to, of course, still uh, serve their uh, minister, but they need to uh, be willing to share, to give at least as much as they are taking from the team uh, back to their ministry. And that's it. And so uh, that, that ensures a uh, culture where giving the gift economy works and there's no free riders and everybody benefits from a fresh pair of eyes and there's no uh, kind of um, a virus of the mind, no ideology that can uh, um, overcome Peters because everybody is so neurally diverse. So uh, just like biodiversity protects against uh, contamination pandemic, uh, what our ideological uh, biodiversity, political biodiversity uh, ensures that uh, whichever uh, petitions, sandboxes, presidential hackathon topics that throws at the team, there's someone at the team who can take that person's side. So that enable our office to take all the sides. And when the office can take all the sides within a large organization, the entire organization will support you in your mission. It's only when you're perceived as taking one particular side at the expense of the other where you'll be in trouble. So the key of co-creation is taking all the sides and a key to agility is to assemble a maximally diverse team that are as much willing to help as they're here to learn. Uh, seven people would like to know, um, as I know you're a civic hacker, still am, uh, before and after becoming the digital minister, happy to see the lowercase minister, what trigger you want to promote information transparency and system participation? Well, well that's, that's literally how I, I learned. I mean, that's my native culture. Um, so back in 1996, when I was 15 years old, uh, I did a few science fairs um, and discovered this great website called archive.org uh, where people publish their preprints they're still around, there's many archives now, um, and the future of human knowledge is being created on the preprint service, and all my textbooks were out of date. So I just told my teachers that I want to quit junior high and start my education on the World Web. And, and surprisingly, all my teachers agree with that. And, and the principal even said, okay, from tomorrow on, you don't have to go to school anymore. Uh, and so basically, uh, the bureaucracy was very innovative that supported me uh, in doing my startups and doing my ventures and doing my university studies, co-creating uh, with professors over the internet, over the preprint service. And because I work with um, those innovative um, bureaucrats, uh, for lack of better term, uh, I remain very optimistic about the innovative capacity of bureaucrats. And of course, the web itself is a open multi-stakeholder political system. So I immerse myself in that system for six years before I even have the right to vote. And, and so for me, that's my native political system. I only know that political system before the uh, legal age. And by that time, I'm, I'm thoroughly naturalized uh, in the internet hacker culture. And so for me, uh, it's literally the only way of doing politics, which is poetics. Um, and then uh, the only way to promote engagement, which is open multi-stakeholder engagement. And, and I think it's a, a rare point in history where people who occupy the parliament uh, successfully agreed on the four demand, not one less, uh, at 2014 during the Sunflower. And it's very rare that the head of parliament agreed with all of them. It was a successful occupy. And one of the demand is to build a grassroots um, civic um, forum on constitutional reform that enabled our rethink uh, how the government works uh, with the people, not for the people. And so I'm very grateful for that. Uh, so five people would like to know, how do you ensure that new sandbox laws are not detrimental to society during the six and 12 months while they're being trialed? Well, we ask for the best white hat hackers uh, to give them a try. Um, and so penetration testing, very important. We dedicate five to 7% of all our IT budget just to cybersecurity. 
and in the next four years, we're expanding that to five to seven percent of the entire uh, budget of all new endeavors, which is a huge amount of money. Um, and so, if you're a white hat hacker in Taiwan, the ethical hacker in Taiwan, you get very well paid. There's pen testing opportunities everywhere, uh, and you get recognized as national heroes. You meet with the president and minister all the time, so that you don't fall to the dark side, uh, which has more cookies. Um, and so, by working with the white hat hackers, we ensure that the cybersecurity, even for our uh, proving ground, the Shaolin uh, Taiwan Car Lab, Autonomous Driving Lab, uh, is um, pen tested for six months uh, before it even opened to the first self-driving vehicle. So that's for the cybersecurity part. And then for the social norm part, just by making sure that those vehicles drive very, very slowly. Uh, and so if they run into things or people, they just run into things or people. They don't hurt things or kill people. Uh, and, and then we look at the post-mortem uh, and see how to improve. And so uh, I think next week or so, Taipei City will uh, apply what we have learned during the tricycle and start the post-midnight uh, uh, self-driving bus. Uh, uh, I think capacity is around 35 people. And they use the same dedicated bus lane. So it's like software-defined tracks. Uh, and um, of course, people have already plenty of time working with dedicated bus lanes. So it doesn't create any new social norm. And uh, it um, basically always can stop quite quickly uh, when they detect something in the front of it. And there's, of course, there's still somebody on the car uh, at the very beginning as a trainer uh, to push the brake, if not, um, you know, speeding it up. So that that is all a kind of um, gradual way of making sure that society expects what to do uh, when they're self-driving vehicles instead of top-down way where the government think, oh, this must be a smart city. You know, what we're saying is that you're all smart citizens. You can help figuring it out. Um, so for people who would like to know, uh, I have experience both in business and also in the government. Uh, how do I think both roles can co cooperate with the law related to digital development? Great question. Um, so by, by law, uh, there's of course code is law, but uh, the textual normativity, the, uh, the law as we know it, um, have a kind of human judges uh, that provides access to justice. So you can break the law, for example, Occupy in the Parliament. And then the judge will find that, oh, it's civil disobedience. So that um, is actually not a crime. However, uh, in algorithmic law, um, often there really is no way to break it. It's like the physics law. If the internet protocols uh, are designed in such a way that all the partnering uh, peers need to adhere to a set of protocol, it's literally unimaginable uh, to be part of the internet while breaking the protocol while breaking the internet protocol, because by definition, internet is the peers that adhere to the internet protocol. Uh, and so it forecloses possibilities, which is why permissionless end-to-end -end innovation is so important, because otherwise the algorithmic um, normativity can preclude certain innovations from happening. And uh, there may be capturing um, ways of essentially just buying all the companies that uh, produce better technologies uh, that actually are detrimental to the evolution of new ideas. And so I think the state um, at the moment, the government can help uh, breaking the um, octopus, <laughs> uh, breaking the, the kind of institutional investments and other kind of de facto controllership, de facto monopoly over the development of technology to empower small and medium enterprises and social innovators uh, to create their own uh, visions of um, chartered cities or chartered um, social innovation labs that runs by their own rules and, and work with the uh, people to show that it's bad or good. Uh, and uh, uh, businesses can help scaling out such uh, developments and work in a way, instead of just doing social responsibility, uh, one can do business development uh, by proving that one can work in circular design in other pro-environmental and pro-social ways, because not to avoid social sanction, although in Taiwan mostly they do it to avoid social sanction, but also uh, social preferential buying, which is what we're doing uh, with our stimulus coupons. And so um, I think the state can design the mechanism such that each participating business, in order to maximize their um, self-utility, also incidentally maximizes or at least optimizes a little bit the externalities. And that is how we mean by participatory mechanism design. Uh, one example, which is very quickly following up the on the air box, uh, the same team in the presidential hackathon did a water box. And the water box 
uh, is given to all the businesses that uh, manufacture things in agric land. Uh, because we have a law that says if you are in the agric land uh, for uh, farming use uh, and you produce anything that pollutes uh, the, the river, the waterways, then uh, the Ministry of Economy uh, can actually shut down your electricity and water directly. Uh, and so this is a pretty powerful mandate. And of course, all the businesses said, it's not me who pollute, it's my upstream that pollutes. And so just like the air box, the water box is a solar powered small box that you can just drop in the waterway and it uses a zero G network to write to a distributed ledger, the top three pollutants uh, in the water and it's very cheap. And so the farmers can just use it to detect pollutions from upstream. All the businesses that are not polluting are incentivized to also install these in their waterways to prove it's upstream that is polluting. At the end of it, everybody has a distributed ledger that shows, uh, and it's easier than air because the air has different dissemination models. In water, you can pinpoint uh, which place do the pollutions happen. And once you have a shared landscape like that, of course the business will be uh, pro-environment and pro-social because really that is in their best interest. And they will be incentivized also to help guarding the waterways. Again, that because that's in their best interest. So uh, public governance using distributed ledgers uh, has such a possibility to transform digitally the incentive structure around externalities and businesses. Um, Audrey, here's Veleka, and I think uh, now it's around 10 o'clock um, mm. in Netherlands and around 4 o'clock in Taiwan. Mm. And um, I find there's still a lot of questions on the Slido and yeah. thinking is it good to have a quick co uh, coffee break? Then we will beg around 10 after 10. Is it That's okay right. to you? Yeah, cool. Yeah, so then we will.
and we're back. Sure. Um, I think most of our uh, partners um, on the way, on online now. Yeah, I think uh, we can uh, resume the session. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so, a anonymous person, or maybe an AI, uh, asked that there are two camps of AI development, uh, and toward what they consider singularity. How do I see the concept of singularity? And how do I position my role uh, to control, okay, or shift, uh, or I don't know, escape uh, innovation uh, or cap law? So um, I'll, I'll read you my job description, and, and that uh, is why I call myself a politician. Uh, and some of you may already know my job description, but I'm going to read it. Um, so um, back in 2016, when I first became digital minister, uh, I told our HR department that this is my job. Description, uh, 1718, 1717, That is to say, reliable data, effective partnership, and open innovation and positioning, you know, as this midpoint in the Venn diagram of the sustainable goals. And um, because SDGs were very fresh at that time, right? It's uh, rolled out in 2015. So by 2016, it's a very new thing. Uh, and the HR people said, Minister, this is too new. Nobody is going to uh, know what you mean by 17, 18, 17, 17, and 17, 6. You have to speak in plain language. Uh, and so I just translated that into plain language uh, as my job description, which I'll read it to you now. My job description reads, uh, when we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let's always remember the plurality is near. So that's my job description. Uh, and so to me, uh, this uh, is my answer to the question. The plurality is here. The transcultural republic of citizens, which is my English translation of uh, the country name, um, is uh, actually very uh, plural in the sense that there is really no single driving value that mobilizes the social um, movement. Uh, the maybe only thing that we can agree is that we're a liberal democracy and we're here to help the world. Otherwise, we disagree on pretty much everything. Uh, and so any vision of singularity um, is um, ineffective in Taiwan's political and social landscape. People would want to augment, to assist, each other and their intelligence, but they want to be smart citizens. None of them want to be smart city residents. Uh, and um, people don't want to be just users. We don't teach in the school media literacy. We teach media competence, which makes sure that people are producers, not consumers of media, so on and so forth. And so that is uh, my answer to the question. I, I do not think there is a single singularity. I think there is a plural of pluralities, and that is the reality here in Taiwan. Um, four people would like to know. Probably a follow-up uh, as well. Yes, a follow -up. yeah, excellent. Yeah. Uh, do, do you have a concern in terms of like, okay, well, outside entities, uh, let's say in other nations or other developments of AI and uh, IOTs, uh, do you have a concern that their agenda may deviate from your agenda? Uh, of plurality. Of course, not only deviate, they're working in completely opposite directions, right? Uh, when we say radical transparency, we mean making the state radically transparent to citizens. Uh, whereas in some nearby jurisdictions, when they say transparency, they mean making the citizens transparent to the state. Um, and so, same, same word, different meaning. Uh, and uh, the coronavirus pandemic only amplified that. So now the state is even more transparent to citizens compared to pre-pandemic. But in some nearby jurisdictions, namely the PRC, the citizens is even more transparent to state uh, than before the pandemic. And so it, it's a great amplifier. It amplifies the core philosophy of all the jurisdictions. And I think there are, there is room, uh, the earth is big enough um, for different governance mechanisms to, to grow. Uh, but of course, we want to make sure that our creativity um, can flow freely uh, without any you know, threat of extinction or things like that. Uh, and we also provide a safe harbor for nearby jurisdictions, which previously we rely on their journalists 
to keep our uh, government accountable, uh, like when there was still martial law, as do remember the days of the martial law. We rely on the journalists from Hong Kong and sometimes from Thailand uh, to keep our um, uh, government accountable. Now, of course, their journalists are uh, looking up to Taiwan uh, and specifically for Hong Kong. Uh, there's many international journalists as international students are now seeking humanitarian aid uh, here in Taiwan, which we're providing. Um, and so uh, the point here is that we're happy to contribute to our vision, the pluralistic vision. We're not saying that this is the only one uh, in the planet, but we think this is a better one. <laughs> and uh, we invite everybody who think this is a better way of innovation to participate in the uh, coalition of the willing uh, of the open innovators uh, on us. So um, HTML, my favorite technology. So the next question is, uh, in my opinion, uh, what or in what field was the next big digital technology breakthrough? Uh, something on the same level as the internet, uh, cloud, the HTML, uh, and so on and so forth. So first of all, HTML doesn't work without the HTTP. They're equally important. Uh, sorry, I have this nerd immunity thing. Uh, but in any case, the, the point here is that um, I think it's not about the next big thing. Um, previously, of course, uh, people would say, oh, universal computation through Ethereum, that's a pretty big thing. Uh, and building all of the distributed ledger, that is a Bitcoin, which is pretty big. I mean, I, I'm a, a, a co-board member uh, of Radical Exchange is an international NGO uh, working on quadratic voting and other social innovations. And I'm working with Glenn Weil and also uh, Vitalik Buterin, which uh, who knows something about Ethereum, uh, and uh, in, in making sure that these ideas develop in the Ethereum, like quadratic funding and so on, gets projected uh, even more to the uh, liberal democracies. Um, that is to say, we incorporate them into our um, national regulations and policies and so on. Uh, so so I think the, the next big thing is still democracy. It's just that democracy reimagined as a set of social technologies. And everybody can be a social technologist that apply such day-to-day decision-making, listening skill mechanisms, and create a pro-social rather than anti-social media landscape. So I'll just use one example. I'm not saying this by itself is the next big thing, but it's a pretty big thing. Uh, and we've been using it quite successfully now. And this is called Polis. It's a very small uh, wiki survey <coughs> um, machine learning uh, toolkit that allows uh, for people to find almost magically their consensus on pretty much anything, a rough consensus anyway. So it's AI powered listening at scale. So what you're looking at is a real conversation. Uh, we first used it in uh, 2015 in Taiwan um, and to deliberate about Uber. Uh, when Uber came to Taiwan, they work with both professional drivers and amateur drivers. And the amateur drivers, of course, is against the, the law at the time. So, but their idea is that algorithm dispatches uh, better than law. So you should, you know, work with algorithm, not work with law, civil disobedience, all that disruptive innovation. Uh, and so uh, we use RegTech, regulatory technology, uh, police, uh, to listen to everybody, Uber driver, taxi driver, passengers, uh, associations, whomever. Uh, and they can see their friends and families on all the different clusters, which identify the different feelings that resonates uh, intergroup. Um, and also intra groups about the Uber. So uh, we shared all the open data about traffic data, congestion data, and so on, uh, to um, data journalists who do sense making. And with four weeks, uh, we run this police conversation and we ask a very simple question What do you feel? What do you feel about this? And then there's no right or wrong about feelings, but there's resonating feelings and less resonating feelings. And then we ideate using face-to-face -face live streamed uh, broadcast meetings to make sure that the feelings that resonate the most become the best ideas. And the idea that take care of most people's feelings ends up becoming the regulations that we use to regulate Uber. And it was a wild success. Everybody is happy with the result. Um, so at the moment, uh, Uber operates in Taiwan through the Q taxi, uh, but search pricing and all those innovations are part of the law and every other taxi company also adopt that as well, which improved the overall experience. So um, the listening skill technology works like this. You uh, get into the website, uh, you see this uh, one statement from your fellow citizens. Um, this one is only from me saying, I think passenger liability insurance should be mandatory. Okay, so you may agree, in which case you move toward me because I'm, I'm right here. Uh, or you disagree. 
in which case you move uh, apart from me. Um, and the software automatically calculates the most divisive point, uh, which is the x-axis, and the, the next most divisive uh, point, which is the y-axis. Uh, and you see the next question, the next sentiment from your fellow system, and then you agree or disagree, and then it goes on, and then you will share. What do you feel? And then you share, and everybody else vote as well. So this builds a literally 100-dimensional space uh, of sentiments, and we run some uh, dimension reduction uh, algorithm uh, to project it to the two-dimensional canvas and use k-means clustering to find the common sentiments. So this is just standard machine learning stuff. And then um, it reflects the crowd back to the crowd. Everybody can see what their friends and family feel like. They are not anonymous trolls on the internet. These are your friends and families. It's just you didn't have a conversation about Uber over dinner. Uh, and so people learn to empathize with all the different sides. And people literally see them merging together into the middle during the three week conversation because there is no reply button. There's no way for trolls to control the conversation. If you don't have the reply button, you cannot make personal attacks. Uh, if you see something you disagree, like with Slido, you can just propose something else and hope that it gets more uploads, and that's it. And so at the end of each uh, police conversation, we still see those ideological divide, uh, divisive statements, maybe five of them, but they don't consume 95% of calories. Rather, we see this huge amount of things here, the consensus statements, where most people agree with most of each other, on most of the things, most of the time. And that's true for any liberal democracy. It's just a filter bubble, the social media, and even some institutional media, uh, makes us forget about the consensus and make us over-concentrate on the polarization. And so a pro-social media, like Polis, is uh, bringing this sense of polity back. This is a real conversation, a virtual town hall, that uh, this one is run in uh, Bowling Green, uh, Kentucky. Uh, and no matter whether group A or B, identifying as uh, Republicans and Democrats, uh, they agree on some very simple things. Like the most consensual one says, um, instead of science, technology, engineering, and ma uh, math, STEM, it should be STEAM. Art should be part of STEM. Uh, poetry, I think, should be part of STEM because it's the same creativity uh, in it. And I mean, it's an essential component. Everybody across the political aisle agree with them then. So when the mayor takes that uh, into account, um, their popularity, the chance of next re-election, just magically grows because they offend nobody by uh, taking on this crowd consensus. Uh, of course, more broadband access, more diversity in telecoms, always a good idea. And so uh, this enabled not only people in the same township, but rather people of different jurisdictions, even across the world. Like we use it to run a US-Taiwan conversation uh, on how to mitigate this post uh, pandemic uh, technologies and so on. So it can be used on any scale. And then it always uh, deterministically actually find the most consensual parts of the population and reflex this shape to the polity, which reassures people that we are a polity despite our cultural and norm differences. And so the common uh, values out of different positions, that is, I think, uh, a very powerful uh, democratic tech. We use a lot of technologies. Polis is just one of the many, but Polis is the most visually appealing, so I'm uh, demoing that, but there's many like that, and I think democracy is the next big thing. Um, okay, so German line. Uh, would like to know, uh, can I share and talk more about the 17 sustainable development goals applied in Taiwan? Give us the holistic picture. We just finished course on circular economy and sustainability. Great, glad to. Um, so the 17 SDGs in Taiwan, uh, we have our uh, voluntary national review, like pretty much everybody else, uh, and we have uh, the voluntary local reviews as well. So if you go to the social innovation platform, si.taiwan.gov.tw, um, you can see this presidential hackathon promo movie that uh, encourages you uh, to participate in all sorts of different um, SDGs, and it colors each and every one of it. So you can see a map of Taiwan. You ask for a holistic view. Let's give you an aerial view. Uh, and uh, you can click each municipality and each county and see in their voluntary local review uh, which SDG they are focusing on. And so um, I'll just you say something about circular economy. So that's 12. Uh, and then uh, 12 um, is New Taipei City in Kaohsiung City. And if you click VVLR, 
well, it opens an issue link, which may or may not work. Live demo. It actually works. So <laughs> then you can go to the circular economy chapter in the VLR. Uh, this is a Mandarin version. I believe they have an English one as well. Um, and then in Kaohsiung City as well. And so if you go to Kaohsiung City, which is having its moment right now in Taiwanese media, um, you can see uh, everything. Oh, actually, you can switch to English. Ah, much better. Uh, and then uh, you can see their local social innovation organizations, what SDGs they're working on. And you can click in these SDGs and find uh, the other, uh, you know, networks. And there's also special topics around um, independent uh, makers of like this one is about telemedicine, uh, which is SDG 3 and 10 uh, and uh, all sort of different topics where we unite the more than 400 social innovation organizations, um, co-ops, enterprises, uh, universities and so on. And it's all SDG indexed. So universities that participate in the university social responsibility program, um, they get their capstone projects indexed through specific commitments like something dot something uh, within the SDG. Uh, and then they can find their natural allies and, and their partners uh, throughout this network for social innovation organizations. And when any uh, enterprise or large organizations uh, procure, like buy from the DM, there's a DM um, where you can see uh, not only the beautiful SDG pictures, but actually um, if you buy more of these things, uh, how much uh, social return of investment do you get? Um, and this is SDG 3, which is good for your health, but also good for the health of the planet. This is circular economy, uh, how you can work to um, reduce uh, waste, zero waste, uh, full circular, uh, while supporting, I think these are excellent mushrooms, or something like that. But in any case, so that if you buy a sufficient um, number of those uh, goods and services, then I personally go out and give you an award. Uh, and so that is the, the way that we encourage more responsible consumption and also uh, make sure that people integrate these um, socially responsible products uh, and into their supply chain. So the first year we run it, which was three, three years ago, people make one time purchases. But by the second year, which was last year, um, more than half of them have integrated these uh, into their supply chain, which means that they understand that procuring from things that have a um, positive instead of a negative externality actually not only enhance the brand, but actually results in better quality because people participate more and give them more ideas. They essentially crowdsource their research and development. And that is what's needed for a circular economy uh, to grow. So that's a holistic picture. You can check it yourself on the social innovation platform, uh, si.taiwan.gov.tw. Um, German uh, also. Sorry. Yes, please uh, keep going. Thanks. Okay. Uh, German also would like to know would, you, would I please share the experience? Uh, so, sorry, sorry, Andre. Uh, uh, sorry, I have one question follow this yes. uh, the, the, the uh, sustainable yes. goals because I noticed the different country have different goals. So, how they set uh, which one is their target? How they define the their uh, SDGs, yeah, mm -hmm. and then uh, also because, as a, as I understand, uh, uh, sustainable you also have to involve uh, citizens. So, oh. uh, how you educate uh, the people? What's the value for buying this uh, this circular circular products? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. All, all great questions. So um, Taiwan is, is pretty um, interesting in the sense that the environmental and social groups have a higher legitimacy than the government. So this is not about the government teaching people. This is about uh, pro-social and pro-environmental groups teaching the government. Uh, and, and we developed this because um, after the lifting of the martial law, there's many uh, very large charity organizations, community building organizations that are still around. Uh, and we only get to directly elect the president uh, in 1996. But at that time, there's a decade or more of those social sector organizations growing, the CSOs growing. And so um, the CSOs have a higher legitimacy even to this day. When there is a natural disaster, if the Ciji charity reports a number and the local government reports a number, people are going to believe the Ciji number. People are not going to believe in the county number, right? So, so, 
<laughs> that's higher legitimacy for you. <laughs> and, and, and the same goes uh, to the Homemakers Union, Zhu Fu Liemong, uh, to the uh, Keras Foundation, Xi Han Er, for, for each of the SDGs they're working on, they have higher legitimacy than the respective uh, chief of the office uh, of the municipality. And so because of that, we, we can't beat the CSOs. We must join the CSOs. And when they say, oh, circular economy is the next big thing, we add it to our national strategy. Uh, that's uh, initially uh, in 2016, uh, when the new government comes in, there's only five uh, topical industries. But the CSOs mobilized and forced the government to include uh, circular economy and uh, new agriculture, the, the Agri Innovation Act Tech, uh, into the uh, priorities. And so this is literally grassroots. And so I, I think the more pertinent question in Taiwan is how are we making sure that people working on pro-social issues can also get uh, amplified by people majoring in business and economy, and how people working with uh, environmental issues can benefit from the latest of all in material science. Uh, and uh, for example, in fashion design, uh, how, to, how do we promote that these things um, are, are more hip um, to, to people? And uh, if we have regulations that harm uh, this, for example, um, we have a national identity drink, uh, maybe you have tried it, it's called the bubble tea. Uh, and uh, uh, there's many people who think that our passport should change our national logo to the bubble tea, and everybody will know that we're from Taiwan. But in any case, uh, the bubble tea, um, if you see the iconography, it usually comes uh, with a straw, right? And the straw is usually draw in a transparent manner, which means it's probably plastic. Uh, and so that actually harms the circularity of things, because plastic straws you can throw away and you know very easily, right? So um, uh, three years ago, there was somebody on the national participation platform joined the GOV.TW that uh, proposed that we gradually ban plastic straws and other single time use utensils in our you know, national identity drink like bubble tea. Uh, and of course they use uh, very provocative uh, imagery such as a sea turtle being choked uh, you know, with the plastic straw and things like that. Uh, and so um, that petition garnered 5,000 signature in very short record time. Uh, and the person, because we all have pseudonyms, uh, is only known as um, I love elephants and elephants love me. Uh, so I have no idea who they are. Uh, but uh, they can get so many signatures in no time. So we have to uh, vote, or our participation officers vote every month on top two issues to face, do a face to face collaboration with and also live streamed. Uh, and so we meet with the petitioner. And she's just 16 years old, a high, uh, senior high school student. Uh, and uh, she's really good, uh, like Greta Thunberg, at uh, you know, mobilizing uh, the social media. Uh, and uh, we're like, okay, but, but why did you propose this in the first place? And she's like, it's our civics class assignment. Our, my teacher just tell us to find something that resonates with the e-petition crowd, and we, we think a plastic straw, you know, not, not good. And so we invited all the stakeholders, including the makers of single-use utensils, and uh, they sat down, and they're maybe in their 60s, and explained that back then, like 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when they first entered this business, they entered out of a social responsibility because at that time, the hepatitis B is prevalent in Taiwan and only single use uh, utensils can protect one another uh, from the hep B. Now, of course, hep B is, is cured, is easily cured. So you don't need that anymore, but the kind of ritual uh, still remains um, in older generations. So they, they brainstormed uh, aside from obvious solutions like glass straws, um, also uh, straws made out of circular material that by itself reduce carbon footprint because it's reusing the agricultural waste and so on. Uh, and so the young people who petitioned point out a new direction, but the more senior people now seeing the new direction actually participated in the material science and design of the new things so they can collaborate on crowdfunding um, events. So now we actually bond uh, plastic straws for takeout but we'll see uh, in Taiwan, and you see all sorts of circular design coming on, and that's uh, all because of a civics class assignment. Uh, and so I think this this is not only a good uh, international um, case of intergenerational solidarity, but also a great way to think beyond uh, that you know old generation linear, new generation circular. The old generation may also be very socially responsible. You just have to help them to clear their uh, browser cache, uh, so to speak, uh, to clear away their uh, misconceptions and preconceptions. So do I go on?
Nicole? Yeah, I think we have uh, time for one more uh, question. Uh, so let's uh, you pick which one you would like to uh, to answer. No, no, no. The the crowd picks the one. So the top one says. But there, are, <laughs> the, ah, there's the top one. I thought there were all four. Okay, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's a yeah. clear winner. So, um, or maybe somebody figure out that you can use private browsing to uh, vote for yourself. But in any case, so could you please share the experience last year when you visited uh, the Netherlands, Den Haag, and Rotterdam, and Germany? Sure. Um, so um, there's a lot of ministerial level visits, um, quite a few, uh, and I'm really happy to see that we align on circular economy, sustainability, and so on. It surprises me that uh, in Germany, they at that time did not consider broadband a human right. It, it generally surprised me. Uh, and um, there's a lot of um, kind of debates around whether broadband is actually good for democracy or not, uh, which uh, from coming from Taiwan, it, it seems very alien to me. But I gradually started getting into the, the point of their uh, culture of basically a uh, just like Taiwan mobilized uh, for the pandemic very quickly because we had prior exposure to SARS 1.0 in 2003. Uh, so we are so good at mobilizing against SARS 2.0, which is the novel coronavirus. Um, the, the Germany, of course, had their history about uh, Panopticon, right? The, the East Germany, uh, Stasi, and so on. And so they, they very much do not like anything that tracks them, uh, including uh, cell phone towers, signals, and things like that. And so I think privacy enhancing technology is something that unites Taiwan and Germany together. Uh, while, uh, of course, in the Netherlands, uh, there's less of uh, that, uh, and of course, still a lot of debates. Uh, and uh, I'm really happy to say that the Taiwan AI Lab have a uh, not uh, privacy uh, infringing uh, design of the contact tracing app that we're not using because we don't have community spread, but we're already working with the UK. So um, if you want to check out, um, I think it's uh, called AILabs.tw, um, they can also help you uh, at, I think it's called covirus.cc. Um, easy to remember, domain name. Right. So if you're interested in that, I'm sure that we have plenty of AI researchers uh, and uh, privacy enhancing technologies uh, that can help you uh, in developing that. Not necessarily branded Taiwan, it's just um, GitHub. So um, I think that's something that we both care. Uh, this is a great thing to unite uh, ourselves together to fight not only the pandemic, but also the infodemic and so on. And I particularly like the Netherlands uh, culture of everything is deliberative, um, even intergenerational issues and things like that, even the pension reform, which is not at all deliberative in Taiwan, I tell you. Uh, it could be deliberated uh, in the in the Netherlands. I think we have to learn from that deliberative culture and using digital technology to help amplifying that culture uh, to the rest of the world. So that's, I guess, uh, the answer to the last question. Great questions, by the way, really good questions. Uh, so I think now because it's almost uh, 1040, so I think it's uh, the almost the close time for this session. So uh, I'm Michelle. I like to uh, represent my classmate to thank for sharing your experience and your insight of the social innovation for to us today. And especially now we know you are really busy on uh, COVID-19 prevention and also you have to launching the stimulus uh, package. Yes. So uh, it's, uh, it's uh, really good for us to learn and reflect from your, uh, how, you, how the government can transfer from uh, work for people to work with people and to use technologies to serve people. And also uh, because I, I, I'm from Taiwan, so I would like to take this opportunity to invite my uh, classmates. Uh, Velika and German, they both from Taiwan because we want to thank you because of your contribution. Now we know our families and our friends, now they are in Taiwan, live safely and healthily. And in the end, uh, we hope we all can use uh, the humor to against the, this crisis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Joy takes us further and have a safe and good lesson time. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah. Velika and Michelle, thank you so much. Really great session. I
think lots of insights uh, for all of us. I mean, it could have easily gone on and on and on. And German, uh, with all your good questions and I think uh, interaction of everybody, thank you so much. Uh, would love to uh, to invite uh, to invite Adri uh, once to let, let us know when when uh, she visits uh, the Netherlands because we would love love to have her uh, um, yeah to have her for a session at the university or anywhere else. I mean, it doesn't matter where, but just to yeah. have other people interact with her. I think. There's so much to learn uh, um, from government. I'm really going to see if I can uh, uh, um, go to government and, and inform some people on this because I think there's so much to learn. Uh, the way they use the open source and they interact with, uh, with uh, the community, with people, really impressive. So thank you so much for having brought this to us uh, and all your effort to do so. <laughs> it has been quite... <laughs> And it was so nice to see all of that and uh, 